But our, our topic this morning is, are you going through a crazy storm? Are you going through a crazy storm? And uh, our, our scripture text is taken from the New Testament, the New Testament verses in Matthew, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. It will be on the screen for you. It says, therefore, anyone, anyone who hears these words of mine, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. These are the words of Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks. Lord, so many, O oh God, are, are going through storms. Some, uh, it could be some crazy storm, Lord. And Father God, we need not walk alone, because you said, Lord, you will be there. You will never leave us or forsake us. So Lord, we just pray that your presence, O oh God, through the power of your Holy Spirit will be with us and be with them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you know, due to the, the great height of, of skyscrapers and, and the fact that they, they literally have to withstand many different kinds of weather and storms, as you can well imagine, huge foundations are needed to support these structures. Uh, construction usually begins with digging a pit uh, that will hold the foundation. The depth of the pit depends on how far down they have to go until they reach, they reach bedrock. For example, when the CN Tower in Toronto was being built, they only had to dig down about 15 meters to reach bedrock. But that was nothing compared to the world's deepest foundation. The Petronas Towers in Malaysia had a foundation that is 394 feet deep or 120 meters. You see, they had to keep digging and digging until the building's foundation could be secured on bedrock. But Jesus isn't talking about skyscrapers made of stones, bricks, or steel. He's talking about building the house of your soul. He's addressing the fact that he wants you to be able to stand strong, immovable when the storm of life come, and they will come. Folks, as, as we look around us, we see countries all around the globe in serious economic problems, political unrest, drug abuse, violent crime, and so forth. It just seemed like there's literally no safe place anymore. The world around us is shaking and our hearts are crying out for a sure foundation, if you will. Every one of us, regardless of, of who we are, or where we come from, or, or economic background, or, or whether we are spiritual or not, we've all experienced storms in our lives at one time or the other. Perhaps you're in the middle of one right now. Maybe it's a storm of, of sickness or, or depression. It could be a financial situation or, or some sort of strife in a relationship. Storms can take on a lot of different forms, but they all share this, this common tendency. They all take a toll on us and, and tend to retard or even stop our progress. But you know what? I like studying the Bible. 
because it gives me truth on which to build my life in good times and in bad times. So here is Jesus telling the, the familiar story of two men building houses. Both men used the same material. Both built in the same geographical location. But one man's house stood while the other man's house collapsed. The difference was in the foundations, the foundations. The one built his house on bedrock and the other built his house on sand. The idea of a foundation is so critical. You see, if you, if you mess up the foundation, you've put the entire structure in jeopardy when a storm comes. Building your life on anything other than what the Bible teaches is really to mess up the foundation. You, you and I know from, from, ex, from life experience that uh, we're either in a storm now, are we coming out of a storm, or we're about ready to enter a storm. So how is your foundation? That's Jesus' point. Some people mistakenly think that trouble is God's way of punishing them or, or maybe he's trying to teach them something. Listen, trouble comes simply because we live in a, in, a, in a world filled with trouble and hardship. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So let's look at this morning at three foundations that the Bible says can withstand, you can build your life upon, which will withstand any type of storm. Any type of storm. Are you ready? Okay, let's, let, let's look at them together. First of all, uh, God's love is a solid foundation. God's love is a solid foundation foundation. Look at me, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 13, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. It says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. One of the most overwhelming things that catches my attention in this verse is the repetition of of the words, all things. Did you catch that? You know what? If you are one who bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, people will accuse you of being blind, weak, and gullible. But God's love is not blind or weak or gullible. Quite the opposite. God's love is strong and powerful. For it comes from the all-powerful God. So, so what crazy storm is battering the house of your soul this morning? Is it an illness? Death of a loved one? Loss of your job? Or, or fear? Or loneliness? Or depression? You got to know that there are two things that you need to remember. One, the storm will end. <laughs> and number two, the love of God is strong enough to see you through it. Love is solid, folks. It bears up under all things or shelters all things. The Apostle Paul says that love provides a solid foundation to withstand the storms of life for the one it loves. Friend, you and I need foundations. The real, the, the real foundation of our life is usually hidden and is only proven in the storm. The Bible says that God allows trials and temptations to come upon us in order to test our faith or to test our foundation. So lady, there's only one sure foundation and that is Jesus Christ. All else is sand. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For no one 
can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Many of you watching the program, you know, you went to Sunday school. And you remember the first thing you learned was Psalm 73, verse 1. God is good. <laughs> Followed by 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. God is love. Oh, the goodness of God and the love of God. You know how I wish that these were the first two concepts we, we would teach our kids nowadays. <laughs> See, too often, unbelievers and even some believers alike generate the false idea that God only occasionally does a good thing. But most of the time, He's basically mean. We hear sermons and testimonies that, to, to that effect saying, Oh, uh, you know, God got my attention when He broke my legs and took away my house and caused me to go bankrupt. Listen, friend, that's not the God of the Bible. That's the Godfather. Remember, you are struggling with a fault, if you are struggling with a fault perception of God, I encourage you to take another look at Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is a perfect reflection of God the Father. In other words, Christ reflects God's attributes, just like the sun's light reflects the sun. Living by that truth is like building a house on a foundation of rock. Storms and hurricanes and floodwaters can do their worst, but the house will always stay standing. What am I saying? I'm saying God's love will endure. Glory to God. Why? Because the Bible says God's love is, listen, patient. <laughs> God's love is kind. God's love is not jealous. God's love does not brag or is not arrogant. God's love does not act unbecomingly. God's love does not seek its own. God's love is not provoked. God's love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Glory to God. God's love rejoices with the truth. Many heartaches will come your way. That's a given. But God's love is the bedrock of your life. You will weather any storm when you have His love. The Lord Jesus says, listen to this, As the Father has loved me, even so I have loved you. Here's my question. Do you know how much the Father loves His Son? Can you even attempt to wrap your mind around that kind of love? But hear what? Even so, says Jesus, have I loved you. God's love for us endures even our shortcomings, you know. <laughs> you see, love can, love can never be destroyed. Love is the greatest force on earth. All right. Second, God's name is a solid foundation. God's name is a solid foundation. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. S someone once said that the sweetest sound in any language is the sound of one own, one's own name. You know, if, if you're in a crowded and noisy airport terminal and, and, they, and they call your name on the intercom, you, you perk up immediately. <laughs> they get your immediate attention simply because what? They called your name. The Bible tells us that the Lord knows, not only knows our names, but that, listen to this, we are engraved on the palms of His hands. Every time He does this, you know, you're there. You're there. Here's my question for you, sir. Do you know God's name? Remember that the word God is not a name at all. It's actually a title, like like president or, or prime minister. 
it, it describes a position. In, in biblical times, you know, the Hebrew name of a person often conveyed a significant message. The name of the Lord is equivalent to the Lord himself. His name represents who he is, his nature, and his attributes. In other words, his name depicts the reliability of his character, his person, who he is, and what he can do. You know, rich folk find their security in money and, and, and their friends and their cities and, and strong walls and so forth. The rich may think their walls will protect them, but God can bring those walls down. That is why the righteous find their security in the name of the Lord. Glory to God. So tell me something. What dominates your thinking? What, it, what establishes your priorities or agenda? What do you live for? What are you devoted to? That is your God. The, the, the world has a multitude of gods. But there is only one true and living, great and glorious God. His name is is the Lord. Glory to God. Psalm chapter 9, verse 10, he said, he says, those who know your name, trust in you. For you, O Lord, uh, do not abandon those who search for you. The name we're talking about is Jesus. You got to get this. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. I'll say it again. The Jehovah God of the Old Testament is Jesus of the New Testament. So watch this. The very name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. That is his task. That's why he became a man and, and took on himself a human nature and, and came to earth to die. Why? To save us from sin and death and hell. That may sound old-fashioned, folk, but it is the heart of Christianity. He came to save you and me. You know what? If you're in a dark place right now, the name of the Lord means God will help. Is that the name of Jesus that the sick are healed and the dead are raised. It's at the name of Jesus that drug addictions and are broken. Is it at the name of Jesus that, that marriages are restored? It is at the name of Jesus that demons shudder and devils flee. Sir, where do you run to when trouble comes? Lady, how do you react at the sign of hardship? Do you run directly to the tower of God's name? Or do you jump into pits of despair or wallow in self-pity? Let me illustrate it for you. In, in, in 1934, 1934, when Adolf Hitler summoned German church leaders to his Berlin office to berate them for, uh, for insufficiently supporting his programs, he was surprised when Pastor Martin Niemöller stood up to him. That evening, his Gestapo raided, raided Pastor Niemöller's house. And a few days later, a bomb exploded in his church. He was later arrested and placed in solitary confinement. Pastor Niemöller's trial began, listen to this, in, in February the 7th, February the 7th of 1938, that morning, a, a, a green uniformed guard escorted the pastor from his prison cell and, and through a series of underground passages toward the courtroom. Pastor Neomola was overcome with terror and loneliness. He was thinking about what would become of him, of his family, of his church. The guard's face was impassive, but as they exited the tunnel and, and ascended a, a, a final flight of stairs, Pastor Neumoller heard a whisper, 
Uh, at first, he, he didn't know where it came from. The voice was as soft as a sigh. Then he realized that the officer was, was really breathing into his, the, into his ear the words and listen to this. The words of Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10. He says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. Right then and there. Pastor Neumuller's fear just fell away. And the power of that verse sustained him through his trial and years and years in, in Nazi concentration camps. What am I saying? I'm saying when the storms of life hit, you can run to his name. You can cling to him in time of need and distress. The name of the Lord is a strong tower indeed. His name is a sure foundation. Finally, salvation is a solid foundation. Salvation is a solid foundation. You know, in our text in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 25 and 27, Jesus says, he says, he says, a day is coming when the rains will fall and the winds will beat on the house of every man. But what storm is he talking about? <laughs> He's speaking about the storm of death. <laughs> the statistics are conclusive, folks. Ten out of ten people die. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, It is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes judgment. Some people believe in reincarnation, you know. They say we die and live and we die and live and die and live. They say we'll only face some sort of an eternal reckoning down the road somewhere. But hear me well, the Bible certainly and completely denies that. But this life is it, folks. And then we face judgment. That means there, listen to this carefully, there are no second chances beyond the grave. I'll say it again. It's so important. There are no second chances beyond the grave. Now is the time to anchor your soul's salvation in Jesus Christ because when we die, we simply face judgment. But look at the awesome sacrifice that God has made for us. He gave us his one and only son. You see, the wages of sin is death. And we're all sinners. We're all under the penalty of sin, which is death. But God gave his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty. He suffered and died on an old rugged cross so you might live eternally, glory to God. No one, no one can fathom the agony cost the Father. Hear me well. When the final storm comes, the ultimate time of testing, the house that is not founded on the rock of faith in Jesus Christ, it will crumble and fall. I might as well, I might as well be honest with you. <laughs> Hear me. Your good works can't save you. Church attendance can't save you. Following the golden rule can't save you. Obeying the Ten Commandments can't save you. Giving to charity can't save you. Religion can't save you. But watch this. God can't save you by His love either, friend. That may shock somebody. He loves you and He will extend mercy to you, but He cannot save you that way. God can't save you, listen to this, until you become conscious that you are a no good sinner and you're in need of his forgiveness. You see, we are all guilty sinners before God and the penalty must be paid. Sin must be dealt with. He cannot simply shut his eyes to sin in order to save us. Jesus Christ came 
to pay our penalty. He did for us what we could never do on our own. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So when you build your life on Jesus and the salvation he paid for with his own blood on the cross, you have a rock-solid foundation to construct the rest of your life now and all the way into eternity. As the old hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let me close. Let me close with, with a story and a couple of thoughts. Romanian pastor Richard Wormbrand spent 14 years in prison for preaching the gospel. Although his captors his captors smashed four of his vertebrae either, uh, and either cut or burned 18, 18 holes in his body. They could not defeat him. Here's what he said. He said, alone in, in my cell, cold, hungry, and in rags, I danced for joy every night. During this time, he turned to a fellow prisoner, a man he had led to the Lord, uh, before they were both arrested and asked, have you any resentment uh, against me that I brought you to Christ? His response was, I have no words, no words to express my thankfulness that you brought me to the wonderful Savior. I would never have it another way, he said. These two men exemplified the supernatural joy of salvation that can be experienced by all believers, even when severe trials and persecutions come. Hear me well, friend. Salvation brings strength for life's journey today and hope for tomorrow. Glory to God. Therefore, we don't have to be defeated by troublesome circumstances. You see, when we know we're saved, we have the assurance that God is at work in our lives, preparing us for for our eternal realities of the better world in heaven. My question for you, sir, and you, lady, what kind of builder are you? Are you building your life on the solid foundation? And here they are again, God's love, God's name, and God's salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ. Or are you building your life without any foundations at all? This morning, I encourage you to take stock of your life. Are you able to withstand the storms of life? Or is the house of your soul this morning collapsing for lack of foundation? Our question is, are you going through a crazy storm? 